as uh, now I get the, the extreme pleasure of introducing a friend of the organization uh, of Global Genes and a friend to this entire community and somebody who's been a real champion of really inspiring us to be warriors together and to unify as an army of, of rare disease advocates because we know that we can change the world when we work together. David Fagenbaum is an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, co-founder of the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network, and associate director of patient impact of the Orphan Disease Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Fagenbaum leads 18 studies, including the first ever R01 funded study of idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease. He is also an IMCD patient in his longest remission on a drug he identified. His work has been highlighted in the New York Times, Today Show, and, his, and in his memoir, Chasing My Cure, which is available to the audience today. Um, and of course, if you haven't gotten your copy yet and you're at home, Amazon is a great place to get it. So um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome David up. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome, thank you. Uh, it, it's such an honor to be here today and I'm so thankful for Christian, his organ organizing this event, to Kim, Global Genes, um, all of you guys for being here today. Uh, when I had a call with Christian a, uh, a few weeks ago, um, we talked about how today is really all about how to. Yeah, in the rare disease community, we, we, all, we, we often think about, you know, what if, and, you know, our aspirations. There's 95% of rare diseases that don't, don't have any FDA-approved drugs. You know, what can we do to get towards, you know, having 100% of diseases, having drugs that save lives? Um, today is, is our attempt, Global Genes, myself, other members of, um, uh, th that will be up here speaking to you today to talk about the how-to. Um, you know, we have all been fighting in our own rare diseases, and we're trying our best to make progress for our given rare diseases, but we all really want to help one another. Uh, Christian and I often talk about how, you know, we're all warriors fighting our, our you know, our, our given diseases, but, but uh, let's really be warriors together, and let's fight um, across rare diseases. Um, so, uh, Thank you so much, Christian, for that introduction. Uh, as Christian mentioned, um, I am a patient uh, with a rare disease, idiopathic multicentric calcium disease, and I'm also a physician scientist studying idiopathic multicentric calcium disease. The picture on the left side of the screen was uh, from July of 2010 when I was a healthy third year medical student training to become an oncologist in memory of my mom who had passed away just a few years before. And then this picture is just from a few weeks later when I went from being this, this healthy medical student uh, to actually being hospitalized just down the street at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania with multiple organ system failure. My liver, my kidneys, my bone marrow had shut down. I had a retinal hemorrhage and went blind in my left eye. Uh, and at the time, we had no diagnosis. And so many of you in the rare disease space um, can, can remember the challenges, well, all of you remember the challenges of getting to a diagnosis, but also sometimes uh, even when you get a diagnosis, um, there's still so much more to be done. So today I'm going to share a little bit more about my personal story. Then we're going to transition into some of the challenges we face for Castleman disease, really thinking, and, and as I'm going through this, I want you guys to think about your given rare diseases. Some of the challenges that I'll mention that we face, I want you to reflect on while I'm talking, you know, what, what are the challenges that are similar that you're facing? Um, then we'll talk through some of the solutions that we came up with for Castleman disease, but keep thinking through it. I know there's also space in your workbook to write some of this stuff down. Think about how this can apply to your given rare disease, and maybe as we even talk through various players and and key pieces of our puzzle for Castleman's, think about those, those same pieces of the puzzle for you. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna spend a good bit of time going through this eight-step approach to research, what we call the collaborative network approach that we've been taking for Castleman disease for the last seven years, and, and really wanna dive deeply into it. I, I see a lot of faces I recognize, um, one, from just being part of this community, but also from the Global Genes Summit. And so I'm gonna to try to spend less time on the kind of the first half of this talk um, and really a lot more time on the second half, the really the nitty gritty part of this. So uh, right around the time that I, um, that I showed that picture for, uh, of myself earlier when I was so sick with multi-organ failure, um, I was so sick that the doctors told my family to say their goodbyes to me. 
and my family had a priest come in and administer my last rites to me because the doctors, my family, no one thought that I would survive. And I've really considered that moment, the moment when a priest was in my hospital room uh, preparing me uh, to die, to be the start of my overtime. And of course, overtime is a time when uh, it's extended time, time you didn't think you would have, but importantly, it's time that you have to make the most of every second. It's time where you can make a mistake in the first quarter and you can make up for it. But in overtime, every second truly counts and you have to live, um, you know, live with a sense of overtime. And I've really lived with a sense of overtime. And, and as you'll hear through my talk, unfortunately I've had a number of deadly relapses, so I'm in my fifth overtime now. But as I look back at my life I, and I think about if my overtime started when I had my last rights read to me in November of 2010, what was my first half of my life? What was the second half of my life? So, so for me, the first half of my life was training to become uh, to, with the hope of playing college football. I, I so badly um, dreamed and wished and wanted to play college football. Um, and, and I got that opportunity, and, and I went to Georgetown to play. Um, but shortly after getting to Georgetown, I had that kind of, for me, what was the most critical and challenging experience of my life, what I consider my halftime. And that was when my mom was diagnosed with brain cancer, with a, a terminal grade four glioblastoma. And, uh, all of a sudden, my life went from you know playing college football and this you know achieving that dream to realizing um, that a there was so much more to life, but also that that I would want to dedicate the rest of my life to trying to, to become a physician and, and to advance science to help patients like my mom. So I really consider that to be my halftime. This is a picture of my mom and I um, a few weeks after. Uh, after her surgery. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away 15 months after her diagnosis. And um, many of you in this room uh, with loved ones with rare diseases and, and those that, that have lost loved ones will certainly know and appreciate uh, just how challenging of an experience that was for me. Um, and I really decided that I would just try to channel all of my, my energy around my loss and my, my grief and really channel it into, into hopefully um, becoming a physician and also starting a foundation in my mom's memory. My mom's initials were Anne Marie Fagenbaum. Her name was, uh, or sorry, her name was Anne Marie Fagenbaum. Her initials were AMF. And so I decided I would start an organization in her memory for other college students coping with the illness or death of a loved one called AMF, Students of Ailing Mothers and Fathers. Um, AMF is still in, on college campuses across the country. AMF now, now stands for Actively Moving Forward because we want to support anyone who's experiencing the illness or death of a loved one, however they define it, whether it's a parent, a sibling, or, or just a, a family member or friend. Um, we've been able to raise a lot of awareness. Um, back in 2008, my face was on the back of 40 million bags of Doritos. Um, to get the word out about um, about rare disease, about sorry about college student grief, um, and we also were able to get a lot of awareness raised through um, through lay press for this issue of college student grief. So so this is really the second half of my life is. I, you know, want, deciding I want to become a doctor and, and pushing forward AMF. And, and then as I shared at the beginning of the talk, my overtime started um, when I became ill uh, with this undiagnosed illness and, and had my last rites read to me. About 11 weeks into my hospitalization, um, I finally had the definitive test done to diagnose uh, Castleman disease. Um, that definitive uh, test um, diagnosed idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, a rare subtype of Castleman disease, but a very deadly subtype um, because so little research had been done. Um, but the diagnosis came just in time. It, it, it came two days before my last rites were read to me, and it came, uh, and then uh, the day after I had my last rites read, I received chemotherapy, and the chemotherapy saved my life. It was basically given, maybe if I'd been diagnosed a day or two later, I wouldn't have survived. But fortunately, the chemotherapy saved my life. Um, unfortunately, I relapsed a few, few weeks later. I needed another round, uh, this time of seven different chemotherapy agents, so kind of like the worst chemotherapies out there all combined at highest maximal doses. But to give a sense for how sick I was when I was in the ICU, I actually felt better with every dose of chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy started to bring me back to life. And so this is a picture of my dad and I, and you can see me sitting up. At this stage, I'd been hospitalized for about four and a half months over a five-month period. Um, and I'm finally sitting up, and I'm so happy uh, you know, that, that I'm alive and that, that um, this chemotherapy has saved my life. Around this time, I was also started on an experimental drug uh, called siltuximab. It's the first drug to ever undergo a randomized controlled trial for idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, and I was so hopeful that this drug was gonna keep me in remission. This was the miracle that my mom never got. This was the, the, the miracle that I was praying for and I was hoping for. Um, this is a picture of my dad and I. 
when I was starting to feel well enough to, to walk around the hematology oncology floor. Um, and I, I know a few folks in here have heard this story, um, but it is, it is my favorite story. And uh, so after spending almost six months uh, hospitalized and, and, and finally getting better with chemotherapy, um, it was New Year's Eve of 2010, and my dad and I decided to take a walk around the hematology oncology floor. Um, and uh, as we passed by the family waiting area, we noticed there was a gentleman who looked like he'd been drinking on New Year's Eve. And um, he was kind of swaying in his chair. And uh, on our next lap around the floor, um, we saw that he had fallen onto the ground. And so my dad ran over to this drunk gentleman and, and helped him back into his chair. And he looked at us and he said, thanks so much. Good luck to you and your wife. We said, wife? What's he talking about? Then I looked at my belly and I realized he thought I was my dad's pregnant wife, <laughs> uh, which was a low point emotionally uh, for, for both of us. Um, but I turned to my dad. I said, man, you've got an ugly wife. Um, and we, we laughed really, really hard. And, uh, it, you know, un unfortunately, the, I had a huge belly because my liver and my kidneys had, had, were failing and I was on dialysis. Uh, but uh, you have to laugh in, in the midst of times like that. And I think all of us in the rare disease community can appreciate that in the midst of really tough times, I think laughter is really the only thing that helps us to get through it. Um, so a few weeks later, I was finally discharged from the hospital, and um, this is a picture I took uh, soon after getting out, and you can maybe appreciate how someone might have thought I was uh, my dad's pregnant wife um, with, with my big belly. And, uh, but, but at this stage, I was so thrilled to be out, and I was really um, you know, so happy to be alive. And this is a picture from a few years before when I played college football. And, and I always say this is like the worst before and after picture of all time. If we could flip the order, then uh, maybe this would be an advertisement for shake weight or muscle milk. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's in the wrong order. <laughs> Um, so I took a picture every week for the next eight weeks, and you can see the fluid going away, my hair starting to grow back, and uh, you know, I look less like my dad's pregnant wife by the end. Um, at that stage, I was able to, um, uh, I continued to get this experimental drug, siltuximab, and I con continued to hope and pray that my disease wouldn't relapse. That this was maybe, you know, I, I nearly died three times, but you know, I'm in overtime, and maybe you know, this drug is gonna keep me in remission. So I came back to medical school here at the University of Pennsylvania, and um, I was very interested in rare disease research, but I really wasn't that interested in Castleman disease research because I knew that other people were on the case. I knew there were researchers in Japan, in France, in the UK, in the United States that were doing Castleman's research. And I, and I hoped and I prayed that those researchers would come up with the solutions um, that could maybe help me and other patients like me. Um, but I did, do, I did get involved in research in one way, and I ended up writing a case report on myself. So I was the, the patient, and then I was also the author of the case report. And the reason I wrote this case report was because when I was in the ICU, and, and I was basically unconscious for 23 hours of the day, as soon as I would wake up, I was totally fixated on these blood moles. So blood moles are totally normal for people to get as they get older. They're typically called senile hemangiomas because you get them as you get older. What was abnormal was that about 25 or 30 of them were popping up all over my chest and shoulders, and I was totally fixated on it, and I would tell the ICU doctors, or I would ask them, you know, what about the blood moles? And they would say, your liver, your kidneys, your heart, your lungs, and your bone marrow are all failing. Forget about the, the blood moles, you know, they don't mean anything. Um, but what we found out with my disease is that with each of my relapses, and I've now had five, that those blood moles are some of the first things to appear. And, and actually, so not only can they help us to to predict and understand that I have a relapse on its way, but also they ended up serving as a really important clue in finding the right drug that's saving my life. And so I think this is an important reminder as, as patients, many of you in this room are patients or loved ones of patients, there are things that maybe at the surface don't seem important to your physician or to a researcher, um, but, but remember that, that you're the one with the disease or your child is the one with the disease and, and, and don't ever stop championing yourself and fighting to share information that you think is important. So I wrote this paper because I wanted to share it with the world so that other patients could be diagnosed, but I also wrote the paper because I wanted to prove to those doctors <laughs> that, um, that told me that they weren't important, that actually these blood moles were important. Um, right around that time, Penn was given a large donation to start the Orphan Disease Center. And um, the, the former dean at Penn Medicine, uh, who's a, a wonderful mentor and friend of mine, uh, was named the interim director. And so I went to Arthur and I said, Arthur, I have an orphan disease. I'm on an orphan drug. I've been a part of building a nonprofit before. Can, can I be a part of the Orphan Disease Center? Um, and he, he graciously allowed me to. And so I was able to be a part of putting together the first strategic plan for the Orphan Disease Center um, and also helping to hire the first director of it. 
A little bit about Castleman disease. Um, about 5,000 patients are diagnosed each year in the U.S., so it's about as common as ALS. Um, there are three subtypes of Castleman disease. Uh, my subtype, idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, is the most deadly subtype. It really affects every aspect of your body. Bas at, at the heart, uh, idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease is my immune system turning on and getting out of control. Um, and rather than just targeting one organ or one part of my body, it, it's basically complete attack on every vital organ uh, and every aspect of my body. So, it, so it, it affects you head to toe and it puts you in the intensive care unit um, because your organs cannot withstand the, um, the, the attack that your immune system uh, uh, takes. It's considered to, to be kind of fall in between an autoimmune condition and a cancer. There are features that are autoimmune-like and there are features that are lymphoma-like. So for right now, um, we actually don't know what category to put it in and, and that's, a lot of our research is focused on just trying to figure out what bucket it should fall in. Um, about a third of patients with my disease will die within five years of diagnosis and another third will die within 10 years of diagnosis. And so this is uh, a quite deadly disease and, and really uh, one of the reasons it's been so deadly is because so little research has been done and, and so few drugs um, are available and there was only one that was in development. I mentioned earlier I was on that drug and, and, for, and the main reason because so little was known about the disease. So um, shortly after uh, returning to medical school and being on this experimental drug I had a full-blown relapse. So all the symptoms returned, I was back in the hospital um, and I was experiencing multiple organ failure and Worse than the fact that I was you know, sick again and that I might die again was the realization that the only drug in development for my disease was no longer working, um, or maybe it hadn't ever been working, um, and that there were no more options. And I had a conversation with my doctor where I said, okay, Dr. Van Rie, he's the, the world's expert for Castleman's disease. I said, okay, this drug's not working, um, but there must be some new cell types or signaling pathways, some sort of new targets that we've identified um, that maybe a drug could be directed against. Are there any promising leads? And he said, no, there aren't. I said, okay, well, you know, are there any drugs that are being tried in other parts of the world that maybe haven't been tried here yet that might, might work? And he said, no, there aren't. And I said, well, are there, are there researchers out there that, you know, have, that I should be excited about and hopeful for that, that have you know, promising leads that we can get behind? And, and, and he said, no, there aren't. And so within just a few minutes, I went from being this really hopeful, optimistic medical student who really believed that for every problem out there, there were either solutions or there were people working on solutions to realizing something that many of you guys know. And that's that for many diseases, there actually aren't solutions and there actually aren't people working on the solutions. And there isn't a cavalry on its way. You guys are the cavalry. And so for, for me, this was a really critical moment in my life. And, and, it, and it really like kind of crushed me to my core to realize um, that for so many diseases, Castleman just being one of them, um, there's nothing being done and nothing will be done unless we do it. Uh, so for me, I decided, I turned to my, my dad and my sisters and my, my girlfriend at the time, now, now my wife, I, I, I told them, I said, I'm gonna dedicate the rest of my life, however long that may be, to try and identify treatments and a cure for Castleman disease. And so for me, that, that took kind of three uh, parallel approaches. One was I began conducting research at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, there was no one studying Castleman disease at Penn, but a colleague of mine lent me some laboratory space so I could start running experiments. I didn't have access to samples other than my own, so I could only run experiments on my own samples. And then I also decided, because I realized how much progress could a medical student really make working on his own in a lab, I decided to create a foundation called the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network, which we'll talk a lot more about in the second half of my talk, but also throughout today, to bring together all of those physicians and researchers and patients around the world, get them all working together to prioritize what research should be done, and then going out and recruiting the best person in the world to do that research. People outside of the Castleman's field. Let's use the field to prioritize what should be done, and then let's go find the best person in the world to do it. Let's bring them in, and let's really drive forward the science. Um, and then also, for me, wanting to be, continue to be a part of the Orphan Disease Center, so things that I learned for Castleman disease could be applied to other rare diseases, things I learned for other rare diseases could be applied to Castleman disease. Um, so in the midst of this you know, journey to try to identify treatments and solutions for Castleman disease, um, I, I graduated from medical school. This is a picture uh, of me with my, with my fiance at the time, Caitlin, and um, uh, was hopeful that, uh, that the drugs I was on, I was getting weekly chemotherapy. The hope was that, that these three drugs could keep me in remission. Um, 
But unfortunately, despite the weekly chemotherapy maintenance uh, strategy that I was following, I had a fifth uh, deadly flare of my disease, and um, we were completely out of options. And uh, uh, we actually don't even have pictures from that hospitalization um, because it was such a scary time. Uh, I was now engaged to, to Caitlin, and, and I so badly wanted to make it to May 24th, 2014. That was our, our wedding date. And um, I, I didn't think that, well, no one thought that I was going to be able to make it out of that hospitalization, um, and certainly not to May 24th. But, but that's all I could think about, just make it to May 24th, 2014. And, and, and I realized that the only way that I would make it to May 24th, 2014 was with, if I turned my hope to be here in May 24th into action. And if I started thinking about what can I actually do, thankfully chemotherapy saved my life and I got out of the hospital. But once I got out of the hospital and as soon as I got back here to Philadelphia, I rushed back to the lab, I rushed back to all the data that I'd been generating over the previous um, nine months and, and started to try to look for some sort of trends in my data. Maybe there's something out there that no one had tried that could maybe help me. And so just to kind of give a, a perspective for the challenge we're trying to face in Castleman disease. So the immune system is extremely complicated. You've got billions of cells all throughout your body, billions, billions of immune cells all throughout your body, um, hundreds of different types of immune cells that all have different functions. And in Castleman disease, we know that the entire immune system is out of control. Um, of course, one of those cells is kind of the initiator and the rest of them are propagating it, but we don't know what immune cell is the driver. We just know the whole thing's out of control. Um, we also don't know what's go gone wrong within those given cells. So not only are there hundreds of different types of cells, there's actually hundreds of different cellular pathways, any one of which could actually be the problem in Castleman disease. And then there are hundreds of secreted proteins that the immune system uses to communicate with other immune cells, to actually to, to drive forward and coordinate responses. So all of a sudden you've got hundreds of different cell types, hundreds of different pathways, and hundreds of different secreted proteins, any one of which could be the problem, any one of which maybe a drug targeted against it could actually solve this disease. But we didn't know what they were. Um, and so dove into my data, hoping for some sort of a lead. And, uh, and of course, all that contributes to what we call Castleman disease. Um, but so hoping we'd find something, and, and I've been running experiments on my samples every month leading up to my, um, my, my fifth uh, flare of this disease. And from those experiments, we were measuring 13, the levels of thir 13 different molecules. And from those experiments, what we found was that there were two that began to rise in the months leading up to flare. So during flare, when I'm in the hospital, everything's out of control. What we found from these monthly blood samples were actually that two things began to rise in the time leading up to it. One is a protein called VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. It's important for blood vessel development. The other one is a protein called soluble IL-2 receptor, which is uh, expressed by activated T cells. So, so now we had maybe a hook that maybe T cells are critical to this, this disease. Maybe VEGF is important. I mentioned to you earlier about how um, I had those blood moles all over my chest and shoulders. It turns out that if you look at any part of my body, any of my lymph nodes, any of my uh, tissue that has been resected, um, my, my samples are extremely vascularized. There's blood vessels kind of in every direction. And so that certainly is consistent with VEGF playing an important role. So now we had a clinical correlate that correlated with the laboratory data that we had. Um, and so we asked, you know, should we target VEGF? There's a drug that targets VEGF called Bevacizumab. It's a chemotherapy drug. Uh, there's another drug that targets T cells called antithymoglobulin. Should we try one of those two drugs? Could we get it approved? I don't know. They're extremely expensive drugs with really, really, really bad side effects. And so we started to ask the question, Maybe, is there something that's a common denominator between T cell activation and VEGF? Is there something, is there a way that we can kind of hit two birds with one stone? So I went back to the, to the experimental data I've been running on my samples, what's called proteomics. So we measured 1,300 proteins uh, in my blood all at once from multiple time points. And, and we ran something called pathway analyses on those proteins. So we looked for common pathways, so, so proteins um, that were elevated that are all part of a, a similar communication line within the immune system that could maybe give us some insights. And this is just uh, a screenshot of one of those. And um, we ran it through three different pathway analysis softwares, and there was one pathway that was present in all three. And that's the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR signaling pathway. I see a few folks in here who are, who are part of the mTOR family. Um, but the, the most exciting thing about the mTOR family um, and, and having a disease 
disease where maybe mTOR is important is that there are drugs that target mTOR and other parts of this pathway. There's a drug called serolimus that was developed over 30 years ago for kidney transplantation. It's a, it's a good immunosuppressant. Um, and so we started to get pretty excited. Well, maybe, maybe we could use this drug, a drug targeted mTOR that's important for both T cell activation and also for VEGF. Um, and this could kind of be the hitting two birds with one stone. Uh, importantly, there is a, an experiment you can run on any sort of tissue sample to ask, is mTOR actually activated? And so we did that experiment on my samples. So this is a, a normal lymph node, and um, blue stains positive for, for nuclei. So any sort of blue you see, those are all the cells in the lymph node. Brown it stains positive for mTOR activation. So if this pathway is on, then there will, be, there will be brown in that cell. And so you can appreciate in a normal lymph node, there's some mTOR activation. You can see that there's some brown in this normal lymph node. Um, and, and we ran a number of normal controls. And then, and then this is my lymph node. And you can just immediately appreciate there is a lot of mTOR activation in my lymph node. And so now we had this VEGF piece, we had a T cell component, and we had the we knew that the mTOR pathway was on, and we know that if you inhibit mTOR, you'll inhibit T cell activation, and you'll also inhibit VEGF. And so this was, was that thing that we thought maybe could serve as a solution for my disease. And so um, I, once I had these data together, I, I shared them with some colleagues, and we decided to start me on serolime as the first ever idiopathic multicenter calcium disease patient to ever receive this drug. Um, and today marks 69.61 months since my last relapse. And you can, you can appreciate um, my previous remissions were, were on average less than a year, um, but now we're over five and a half years that I've been in remission on this drug. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Susan. Thank you all. Um, and I say 69.61 months because like those of you in the rare disease space with loved ones with rare diseases, we have no idea what tomorrow holds for us. So I can't round up. I can't say it's been 70 months because I might be back in the ICU in, in five or six days. And that, that's how quick this disease comes back. But I won't round down either because my colleagues, my team, my warriors, we fought really, really hard you know, for every part of this 69.61 months. And so, so I won't round down either. Uh, the New York Times a couple years ago called this Doctor Cure Thyself, um, which I think is a, is a bit of an overstatement. I think it should probably be doctor helping himself a little bit right now and hopefully for a lot longer. Um, uh, but who knows? And, and, and like I said, hopefully for a lot longer. Um, but importantly, during this remission, uh, my wife and I, we were able to get married. Uh, I made it to May 24th, 2014. This is a picture of us on our wedding day. And you can see that my hair grew back just in time. This has never before been cut hair that you're seeing in the picture. And uh, that was actually really important to me because on my wedding day, I just wanted to look normal to Caitlin. I wanted to not have the physical reminder that all of us knew um, what kind of boils beneath the surface in me. And so it was, it was important to me for, for my hair to come back just in time. And then 14 months ago, uh, Caitlin and I had our daughter, Amelia. This is our, our sweet Amelia who makes us so happy. Uh, she's a little nearsighted, so she wears those cute glasses. I think they're a great accessory. Um, but she's, um, she's the sweetest girl. And, and as you can tell, just smiles uh, so much. Importantly, we've also um, begun to give this drug serolimus to other Castleman's patients. This is patient Joey, who about a year ago um, was hospitalized down the street at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, with multi-organ failure Cas with Castleman disease. He didn't respond to first-line or second-line therapy, um, and so we ended up giving him serolimus, and he had a really, really positive response. Joey's now been in remission for about a year. Um, this is a picture of him with two of his siblings. Um, and then this is a picture, Katie, of another Castleman disease patient who has a, a, a different form of Castleman disease or a less severe form of Castleman disease. But actually, you guys will hear from her mother, Maleva, who will be speaking this afternoon. Um, because uh, Katie had a really tough road with, with, with her form of Castleman's and actually has responded quite well to, um, to serolimus. And this is just one of my favorite recent pictures of Katie. Um, Unfortunately, uh, so though we do have these really exciting success stories, unfortunately, um, this drug does not work for everyone that we've given it to. 
Um, we just launched a clinical trial about three weeks ago. We enrolled our first patient in the trial two weeks ago, and so we plan to study 24 patients systematically on this drug. Um, but the drug's also been given off-label to about 15 patients, and about half of those patients have not responded to the drug. Um, most of those patients are no longer alive because they ran out of options. And so as excited as we are about the progress that we've made, um, we're really, uh, we're motivated and we're inspired by those people who this drug didn't save their life, to continue to fight for this disease. We've made a lot of progress. The title of my book is called Chasing My Cure, and a lot of people are like, that's awesome, you've cured your disease, like, you know, are you gonna move on to the next one? And it's, it's no, we've made progress, but there's still so many people with Castleman disease that we need to keep, keep pushing the science forward for. So um, this next slide and, and this next part of the presentation is in, in the second half. So that's the first half of the talk, and now we're, we're at halftime. Uh, second half of the talk is really transitioning into the hows of, of how, how do we do this and how did we do this. Um, uh, I don't need to give you guys, this is a background slide about rare disease. Um, this is uh, something you guys don't need to know about the, the plight of rare diseases you guys live with and know. No challenges in the rare disease space. Um, there are a lot of rare diseases. They affect, affect a lot of Americans. And unfortunately, despite the major need, there's a major unmet need um, because there are not existing, or there are not FDA approved drugs for, for, for nearly all, uh, more than half, uh, and nearly all of rare diseases. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and a lot of the problems that, that we face for rare disease um, are, are really systemic problems. And so in the middle of my journey, what I didn't mention is after medical school, I went to business school. And that's because I realized as I started to fight Castleman disease that some of the biggest challenges in the fight against Castleman disease were not issues of medical technology or science. They actually were issues of organization, coordination, collaboration, um, issues that, that I thought that business school could help me with. So, uh, when we were looking at how do we take on Castleman disease and, and what do we do, I mean, I, I kind of, the first half of the talk is like, this is, I think, a model, and an, uh, or it's at least a vision that I think all of us in the rare disease space have, and that's to find a drug that helps someone that we love. I mean, I think that's, that's why we're here, right? Um, but but what, what I want to talk about during this second half is, is the how-to. Um, and so when we think about tr the traditional approach to biomedical research, the traditional way to do things is to raise money um, and then invite researchers to apply to use the money how those researchers um, envision is kind of the best way to do it. And then to have an expert, expert panel pick the best applicants and say, you know, this is the best applicant we want to fund this particular applicant. And then, of course, in parallel to provide incredibly supportive resources to patients along the way. This model works really, really well at the NIH when you get thousands of applicants and you have millions of dollars to give out. It does not work very well when you have a disease like Castleman disease where we had a handful of researchers and we had $10,000 to give out in our first year. It's just statistically completely unlikely that any one of those five researchers is going to have the most important research idea for what needs to be done and also have the skill set to deliver on doing that research as best as possible. It's just, it's just not going to happen. And so we just realized for Castleman disease that there had been two foundations before the CDCN that had been doing really good work at supporting patients and, and, and uh, bringing together people. But unfortunately, very little progress had been made because we were just kind of raising money and then hoping and praying that the right person would apply for the right project at the right time. And, and that's kind of like waiting for the stars to align. And like I said, it works for the NIH. If you have millions of stars, the stars align. When you have three stars, the stars don't align. And as rare disease patients, we don't have the patience, and loved ones, we don't have the patience to wait for the stars to align. Um, and, and as a result, this approach can, can take a long time. Um, it can actually even uh, cause there to be real, uh, real competition within the community to say, you know, if you've got one grant uh, and everyone's applying for it and, and you've just got a small community, it's unlikely it's gonna be the best science, it's unlikely it's gonna be by the best scientist. And that's not because it's gonna be by someone who's, by scientists who are not 
well-intentioned or who are not totally committed to your disease, it's just unlikely that they're going to have the best idea and be the best uh, scientist to do it. So we decided to take a very different approach uh, back in 2012 when we started. Um, and this was uh, really inspired uh, by the work I did uh, to set up that first strategic plan for the Orphan Disease Center, kind of understanding what is the landscape in the rare disease space, and can we come up with a new way to do things that doesn't just rely on hope and prayer. Uh, hope and prayer, prayers are both extraordinarily important, um, but we need to reflect on what we're hoping and praying for, and then think about what can we do about to, to make those hopes and prayers get closer to reality. So for us, we decided to take a very different approach. Um, we started out, we spent almost two years at the beginning identifying all the physicians, researchers, and patients worldwide um, that either have Castleman disease or treating Castleman's or conducting Castleman's research. But the idea is first find all of the researchers, you know, who is out there and get the patients involved as well. So build a community. Um, and we'll talk throughout the day about, about this concept of building a community. Next, once we built that community, once we identified all the physicians, researchers, and patients, we needed to understand what was known today. Because you really can't decide what you want to fund or do tomorrow unless you have a really, really good grasp for what does the world know today. If you know what the world knows today, then you can figure out where are the gaps in what's known, and you can start to push things forward. Um, so once we had a community, and we were all in agreement on what's known and what's not known about our disease, that's when we turned to that community of 400 physicians, and we sent them a series of surveys. It had th or, or a survey was a series of questions. The first question, what research questions need to be answered to make the most impact in Castleman disease? What research studies could answer those research questions? And what researchers are you aware of that do those studies well? So we could get away from the RFP approach, which is, we have money who wants it, and then you get ideas from only people who do research and are capable of doing the studies. We said, we're not just interested in, in research ideas from people who can do research, we're interested in ideas from everyone, from physicians who don't have time to do research, through patients who have the disease. We want ideas from everyone. Let's get all the ideas possible. And there were some amazing ideas, and there were some not so amazing ideas. But let's get all the ideas we can get, and then let's start prioritizing what research should be done. So, so we call this crowdsourcing, but it was a simple three-question survey. And then it was a number of meetings to prioritize what research should be done. We're getting a little bit more tech, tech savvy with other tools these days, but, but really early on it was just a simple Google survey. Once we prioritize what research do we need to do, the next step was to say, okay, who is the best person in the world to do this study? I don't care if they know what Castleman disease is. I don't care if they've done Castleman's research before. Who is the best person in the world to do study one, study two, study three? And so then we went out and started trying to recruit them to say, listen, you may not know anything about Castleman disease, but we've got money and we've got, well, we didn't have money at the time. We're gonna try to get money and we've got samples. And so we went out to recruit these, these researchers. Then we started the fundraising. Once we, once we got researchers interested and said, yes, this is how much it'll cost. It'll cost $100,000 for this study. It'll cost $350,000 for that study. But we wanted to say, who are the people? Let's identify what the study is. Then we can go out to our community and we can say, we need to fundraise for this researcher to do this study that has been prioritized by the community. You helped to prioritize this study. Now help us raise the money so that we can do it with the best person in the world to do it. And in parallel, getting samples. So in the rare disease space, if there is an animal model, that's amazing because you have work that you can do on an animal model. But as we all know, animal models don't always trans translate into human disease. And so um, human samples, in my opinion, are extremely important in the rare disease space. So, so getting as many Castleman disease patient samples as we could to these researchers was critical. Then we started to actually execute that plan. The, this international research agenda turned from a plan into action. As we started executing those studies and started getting data back, we share the data back with our community because now that community is more informed. They know more about the disease. So when we send the next round of surveys, they're better. They're even better at crowdsourcing and even better at prioritizing what research should be done. As we also get back results from our studies, we always ask the question, which, which you heard me ask earlier in my data, was when, we wanted, when we're learning about the biology of Castleman disease, we always say, what drugs already exist that may be approved for something totally different have activity against that particular pathway, that cell, whatever it may be. Because 
we're not just doing this to like find out what is wrong. We're doing, we're trying to figure out what's wrong so we can fix it. And so, so you know, as we do research, we're always asking the question, what drugs exist that can target that tomorrow, as opposed to you know potentially a lot longer from now. And of course, what happens when we find out things that are wrong and we ask, are there drugs? We try drugs because when you have a deadly disease like Castleman disease. You have no other options, and so, so lots of drugs are tried in what's called off-label fashion in Castleman disease. Chemotherapies are thrown at Castleman disease, immunosuppressants are thrown. All kinds of drugs get thrown at this disease, but up until we got on the scene and until the collaborative network approach, there was no data being collected on what was working and what wasn't working. We had to kind of hope that someone randomly would write a case report and it would end up in the literature, and then you're only getting a very narrow and small fraction of all of the uses of drugs. And so we created a natural history registry, so any patient in the world can consent themselves online, they can enroll online, and then we can get their medical data and we can actually understand what's been given and is it working or is it not working, so we can be a bit more systematic. So if people are using off-label drugs, we can see does it work or not. Um, and then the goal, and from there we say, well, among the things that are being given, are there any things that are really promising? So then we move those forward to clinical trials because clinical trials are really critical. Even if drugs are being used off-label and anecdotally they're helping people, it's really important to move to a formal, rigorous clinical trial because doctors like clinical trial data, insurance companies like clinical trial data, and, and unfortunately, doctors and insurance companies are the gatekeepers that are gonna be between you and drugs that might be able to help you and patients with your disease. And so, so we are always asking, what drugs should we move to clinical trials? And then our ultimate goal at the end of the day, for everything that we're doing, is to identify a treatment for every single patient diagnosed with Castleman disease. We want, we, we want every patient diagnosed with this disease for us to know what treatment's most likely to help them based on their particular unique profile and then get them the drug as quickly as possible and then get them back to their previous disease-free quality of life and hopefully the goal would be that they could live as long as they would have without Castleman disease. Um, but we're not gonna get there to that that goal of personalized me medicine unless we take each of these steps uh, along the way. We track all of this research on what we call our research pipeline. Um, so any researcher, any patient around the world can go online to one central place and they can see all of the studies that are being done worldwide for Castleman disease, I think transparency is really critical in the rare disease space. Um, and I recognize that for a lot of researchers and a lot of academic institutions, we're sometimes hesitant to be transparent about things because you know, we're on this new lead or that we think that you know, someone's gonna, the, the term is scoop, someone's gonna scoop us and they're gonna steal our idea. Um, but, but we need to get over that. And, and what we really need, in, in my opinion, in the rare disease space is for everyone to know what's being done so you can see what other lanes there are next to you and you can make sure that you know, every lane is covered and if, the, if one lane isn't covered, then maybe you can jump into that lane um, and start pushing things forward. Um, we also uh, collect and share samples uh, from, from patients around the world. We have an uh, ability to consent patients electronically. We can consent them online or we can consent them by telephone. We get the samples collected at their hospital and sent to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we also connect and support patients all over the world. I mentioned Maleva will be here later today and you'll hear from her about how she supports patients around the world. Um, and something I'm really proud of is that the work we've done has really been on the shoulders of medical students at Penn, business school classmates of mine, patients with Castleman's, loved ones of, of Castleman's patients. And so I, I think that those of us in the rare disease space, we all roll up our sleeves, we all get to get fighting against these diseases, but I think it's also really important to think about who else can we pull in um, to fight alongside us. We've um, raised and invested about a million dollars into research over the last seven years. I mentioned our first year we raised $10,000, and so I don't think I ever thought that we would get up to raising a million dollars for research. Um, but what's really exciting is that the million dollars that we've invested into research has resulted in an additional $7 million in funding from the federal government and from foundations. And so it's, you know, for a small, uh, foundation like ours, raising a million dollars has been really hard and it's been a lot of work. Um, raising eight million dollars would have been even harder and just would have been impossible, I think. But, but through really focused and strategic investments of those million dollars into the right places, that's resulted in an additional seven million dollars that we never could have raised on our own that's actually being invested into Castleman's research. So I think this is an important model for many of us in the rare disease space, those of us who don't have unlimited resources, which I think is all of us. And so, you know, finding out ways that we can invest really smartly into, into particular areas that'll result in additional um, investments. Uh, we've also, uh, as a result of our work, 
identified the first new drug target, this mTOR pathway, first target identified in Castleman's in 25 years. We published the first diagnostic criteria ever for Castleman disease, the first treatment guidelines ever, um, and, and I mentioned that we're enrolling patients into this clinical trial. So where are we today? This slide starts out with where we were in 2012, um, and then kind of superimposed, you can see that we've, we've made a lot of progress. So the disease is better, well, is more well-defined, there's a diagnostic criteria, there are treatment guidelines, we've got a really coordinated uh, research agenda, we've got a, a large network of physicians and researchers that are part of this, this effort. Um, we have this natural history registry I mentioned where we collect data on patients from around the world. We have a biobank where we collect samples from patients around the world. Um, I, I was able to receive the first federal grant ever to study Castleman disease this past year, which includes the funding to do this clinical trial. Um, we have patients engaged uh, really in, in everything we do. And that drug that I mentioned that didn't work for me, um, that was in experimental trials, went on to get FDA approval. It actually works for about a third of Castleman disease patients. So that is a huge step for our community. We actually have an FDA approved drug, and it's game changing and it's life saving for a third of patients. Two thirds of us, that drug doesn't work in, and so that's what we're working on. Um, but of course, every step is really critical. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left, and so I'll go through a bit around um, uh, the, the specific steps. I gave kind of the big picture for the collab network approach, but then we've tried to boil it down to eight steps. Um, and so the first step is build a community. I, I mentioned that earlier, and, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, many rare diseases do it better than others, but the concept of building a community is really important to so that patients and loved ones have other community members to support one another, to be there for one another. But beyond that, I think it's really important to think about kind of the other reasons that you want to build a community. Number one is for support and, and connecting people because Nothing is, is harder than having a rare disease and or having a loved one with a rare disease and feeling totally alone. So support is number one. But do also remember that that community can actually be your army to do research. And, and, and that community, in addition to being a great place for support, it can also be, um, it can be the foot soldiers in, in helping to drive forward science. So, so build this community with, with in mind the idea that this community can actually help to drive forward treatments and cures for your given disease. The next step is to crowdsource and prioritize research. I'm gonna go through um, uh, in, the, in the last few slides around the different tools you can use. I mentioned to start, we just used Google surveys, three questions, really simple survey. Um, more recently, we moved to using a platform called CoDigital. CoDigital.com, it's freely available for crowdsourcing. It's not a medical crowdsourcing site, but it's for anyone who wants to crowdsource an idea. So we moved from Google surveys to CoDigital, and on CoDigital, we asked questions like, what research, question, or what research questions need to be answered? What, what research studies could be done? What researchers are you aware of that do those studies? And we just let anyone and everyone propose ideas, patients, physicians, researchers. And the cool thing about CoDigital is you can vote things up and vote things down. Um, so if you think it's a great idea, you can actually even edit other people's ideas. So we did that with CoDigital for a while. More recently, we partnered with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to try to create a platform that could be shared more broadly um, with other rare diseases. And so uh, we've recently identified a, a, a vendor or a platform called Discourse, um, which actually allows this functionality built in within the community for upvoting and downvoting. So we're, we're working on it, and hopefully um, by early 2020, um, we'll have some, some plans or at least uh, be able to share with you guys about how Discourse is or is not working um, for our community, with the goal being that in the same place where patients and researchers or, or posting questions and comments, they can also post ideas about research right there in discourse. People can upvote them, downvote them, all in one place. So, so you build the community, you use the community to crowdsource and prioritize research, and then once you have your list of studies for us, it was about 20 studies to start um, that we dreamed of doing. Uh, we had you know, no money, um, but we had you know, a lot of dreams. Um, but then once we had this list, we went out to say, who is the best person in the world for the given, given um, study? And so we went out to try to identify them. This is a tough step. This is where you'll really want to lean on your scientific advisory board, your medical advisory board, for help with figuring out who is best, and also to be a part of those conversations to make sure that, that you can really um, 
say all the right things to try to persuade um, them to get involved in your space. Before um, this talk, I was, I was chatting with, um, with a couple of members of the Radio Z space who were asking, you know, are there researchers out there that have um, that are really talented, that have kind of free bandwidth that maybe we could recruit to our disease. And what I, what I shared and what I, I feel quite strongly about and, and believe is that there actually are no, res there are very few, if any, researchers out there who are kind of like scratching their head about what to do. All of us are doing a lot of different things, mainly because there are like an infinite number of important research questions to answer. I mean, there's unfortunately a lot of biology that needs to be uncovered. So all of us are busy doing a lot of things. What you guys can do isn't find a researcher who, who has free bandwidth. What you actually want to do is find someone who doesn't have bandwidth, but who's very, very good at research, and persuade them to redirect some of their bandwidth towards your disease versus, versus uh, another project that they're working on. So um, identify the top researchers. As I mentioned earlier, our community really got behind fundraising for specific studies. Our community doesn't like saying, like, we're going to raise you know, $10,000 or $100,000 to cure Castleman disease. They like saying, I'm going to raise $100,000 to do this study with this researcher at this institution that's going, to re that's going to yield these results. And so for us, by prioritizing first, fundraising second, that made fundraising a lot easier. Um, once we had the money in place, I mentioned we were recruiting researchers who had never done Castleman's research before. We still recruit researchers who've never studied Castleman's before which means they don't have any samples. It means they don't have any data about Castleman disease. They, many times they don't have any ideas about Castleman disease, but they're the best person in the world to do a particular study, so you have to get them the samples, you have to get them the data. When you move into study execution mode, and, and basically each of these steps, the eight steps, you're never done, in, in my opinion, with any one of these steps. I, I see these steps, these eight steps, being applicable to every single study that we do for Castleman disease. We're always trying to improve our community. We're always crowdsourcing. And so each one of these steps, these, these eight steps, applies to every one of our studies, and we're at a different stage for each study. But when you reach step six of study execution, that's where foundations often step back. And we say, like, you know, let them do the research. Um, we've given them the money. We gave them the samples. Like, you know, let them do their thing. Um, but I think it's actually really important in that phase to stay connected with the researchers, to make sure that they know that you're there and make sure that they know how excited you are for the results and how you, know, you can't wait to get the results and keep checking in with them. Um, I know in a, in a busy academic uh, world like I'm in, um, it, time is, is limited and, and it's, trying to figure out where you put your time is hard. So, so keep reminding them, because uh, remember, you're likely one of multiple projects or multiple areas that they're studying. So keep reminding them uh, about your project. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, the data analysis piece, how there are a number of, of open source and free tools. I'll mention a couple in a couple slides. Um, but importantly, uh, we want to know what's going on in biology. But like I said earlier, it's, you know, what drugs might exist already that could, could, could impact that biology um, right away? So we're always asking those questions. And then once we finish our study, it's then time to disseminate knowledge. We can't just publish in a journal and expect that everyone in the field is going to read that journal article and that it's going to just magically get out to the world. I think the key thing here, um, and, and really a theme throughout my book, is, is turning hope into action. If you hope that it gets out to the world, well, what are you going to do to get it out to the world, right? And so it, you know, I think that this disseminating knowledge is, is a step that many of us forget about. Um, you know, the study was published. That means everyone studying this disease must read it, and that's just, just not true. So you, you need to you know, proactively push forward um, understanding. And so a couple, I think that you guys will have access to all these slides. I, I believe so. And so sorry the font's a little small, but you'll have access to all these slides. You'll see some of the things that we used. The building a community, we started out um, a very manual process of um, going to PubMed, which is the database of all published medical research. I did a search for Castleman disease, and I got over 2,000 results. And then I just started emailing one by one um, through the, that list. Um, which took a long time. It took months to get through that list. Um, so we're actually working with Chan Zuckerberg Initiative also um, to try to automate this a little bit more. They purchased a company called Meta, and Meta will do this sort of database curation for you. And so I hope that, again, in early 2020, that we can give you guys some updates on ways that Meta could actually help to do some of this a little bit more automated uh, than you know, having someone like myself spend months writing emails. Um, so I reached out to, the, to anyone who was associated with Castleman disease. Um, 
We, of course, tracked them in a central database. Early on, it was just manual entry into Google Spreadsheets. Um, now we uh, are, are trying to use a CRM, again, through this partnership so that we can track things more systematically. Our discussion board early on was a website called GHD Online. GHD Online is Global Health Delivery. It's a, a website for, um, for global health researchers to communicate with one another. Castleman disease has nothing to do with global health. But I just asked this, this website, like, can you give us some free space? And they did. Um, and I think that that's probably something you guys, that's probably in all of your playbooks. You know, even if it's not related to your rare disease, ask, try to, try to get some space. Um, let's see, and like I said, I think all these links are gonna be available. Um, but of course, tracking patients, uh, connecting them. We, we use Rare Connect, which is a Eurotis platform for patients to connect with one another. And of course, Facebook is used extensively in the Castleman space. Um, so this is a, a map that's not updated. There actually should be a lot more dots. Um, but, but the physician researcher community has really been connected uh, for Castleman disease. This is a bunch of Castleman's researchers doing what we call the warrior flex. Um, it's kind of like a Castleman warrior flex. Um, and these are a bunch of Castleman's patients who are connected as part of our community. Um, and then a bunch of patients here in Philadelphia at our um, annual meeting also doing the, the Castleman warrior flex. And then these are just some of our patients um, that are distributed all over the world. I mentioned about 5,000 patients diagnosed each year, um, but it really affects individuals of all ages and um, uh, certainly uh, all walks of life. So the step around crowdsourcing, I mentioned earlier CoDigital. Um, we also used to do this kind of indirect crowdsourcing where we actually would systematically go through um, uh, Facebook and other public venues where things were getting posted to see, are there any clinical insights or research insights that could be gleaned from public posts? Um, uh, that's what we called indirect. Direct was when we actually asked the specific questions. Um, and then I mentioned earlier, we tried to track everything in a central place. Another thing that I want to highlight is that um, when we first started out, the medical community, I mentioned we didn't have a good sense for what was known and what wasn't known. So I really encourage you guys to work with, um, with your scientific advisory board to be able to diagram out, like, how do we think this disease works? And a lot of times, researchers are kind of hesitant to try to do that. And it's like, well, this is just how I know how it works. It's like, well, you might know how it works, but let's just like diagram it. You know, let's get it down on the paper because as a, as a foundation, you should really have a good grasp for how, for what's known about the disease biology. We may not know a lot of things, but let's at least get onto paper what is known and what isn't known. And so like, this is basically how it used to be, which is like, oh, we think that this protein called IL-6 is important and it causes signal transduction and it causes Castleman's. I mean, this is like not the kind of model you want for your disease because it's very vague and it doesn't really tell you anything. Um, so we try to get from this to where we are today, which is where it's a lot more like, this is what we think it is. This is these are hypotheses. There's pieces of this, the dotted lines are things we don't know. So you, you want to like have a framework that like you can, guys can all work off of. And you can point to it and you can say, OK, so this study that we're trying to fund will help us to answer this question. And you can point to it. And, and I think it's really important for you to be able to work with your community to be able to say, well, what is known and what isn't known, and, and to really point to it. So we simplify it even further to like this. And we're like, these are the different hypotheses. You know, we're trying to figure out cell types. We're trying to figure out particular aspects of it. So we have our international research agenda. Um, uh, these are all of our studies that are currently either complete or underway um, or in progress. Uh, None of these studies were being done before we started out in, in 2012. So we've been able to launch a ton of studies. Uh, we still have a lot more work to do, but it's, it's really exciting when you can prioritize these studies, you can list them out, they're in one central place. Anyone who's ever been a part of the Castleman's community can see the status of all of our studies. And I think that's really, really important for you guys to work towards. So you should have a framework, what's known, what's not known, how do we think the disease works, and then you should have a parallel listing of all of the studies that are underway and how each one of those studies is connected to each piece of that framework. So, you know, we do research around what's the etiology, what are the cell types, signaling pathways, cytokines involved. And so these are the key questions, and you need to be able to tie back and forth what you do for research to where the gaps are. Um, I mentioned, you know, identifying top researchers, um, working with your uh, scientific advisory board to do that. Fundraising, um, we all know that fundraising is really hard. Um, and we've used platforms like Mobile Cause. We have a Castleman Warrior program where, where we connect patients to try to raise money, um, kind of uh, grassroots uh, fundraising. 
We have individual donors that we work with and also corporate partnerships. We put on a, a gala every year. For those of you that are local to the Philadelphia area, our gala is coming up on November 9th, just in a couple weeks here in Philly. Um, would obviously love, uh, love for you guys to attend. It's always a really, really fun evening. Um, we do a World Castleman Disease Day, day um, every July. Sample procurement, um, uh, we have a place in our website where patients can learn about contributing samples. I mentioned earlier that a major, uh, major progress is made for samples when we created an ability for patients to consent themselves or online and be able to send samples to us in the mail. Um, that was really critical. Uh, we also do the same thing with medical records or natural history registry. Patients can consent online and we can get their medical records. It's often hard to get samples and data from other researchers, so we've kind of decided, we still try to get samples and data from researchers, but we try a lot harder to get samples and data directly from patients. Um, these are just like a couple examples of how we've been able to, to make progress based on, on our research. We've been able to identify laboratory tests that can help to predict who's likely to respond, who's not likely to respond um, to drug. Um, I mentioned this natural history registry, Accelerate, um, with the goal of better understanding the disease and also tracking off-label drug use. Um, we actually now are up to, so it was 154 at 19 months, it's been another year and a half, we're about 300 patients um, that we have enrolled in our, in our medical, in our uh, natural history registry. We extract out about 3,000 data points per patient. It's extraordinarily manually labor intensive, but when a patient consents into our registry, we get their medical records and then we have data analysts go line by line through every single line of the medical record. So some of our patients have 10,000 pages of medical records and that can take weeks for uh, someone to manually go through. But we do that. We manually go through every single record. We put them into this database. Um, and, and amazingly, over th or almost 40 different drugs have been used off-label that we found through this effort. Study execution, um, my, my point here is just to say it's not just you figure it out, it's you know, get involved in the contracting stage, stay involved in project management, frequently check in with them, and make sure, and one excuse for checking in is to say, look, we now have this central pipeline where we have to list the status of all of our studies. You know, help me keep that up to date. Um, but I think that having that uh, is really, really important. There's a couple um, pathway tools that, that we used in my case that I would just mention. There are many tools available online. Ingenuity, you have to pay for. There's a free website called Enricher where you can do the sim similar sort of pathway analyses that I mentioned. And there's a database called Lynx 1000. Lynx 1000 allows you to get some insights into drugs that might work on a particular pathway that, of interest um, that are already FDA approved. Many of the drugs in that database are actually not even yet FDA approved. They're compounds, um, compound libraries. But these are all tools, and, and like I said, there's many others, but these are the tools that we like to use in my lab. Um, let's see, uh, and then I, I showed you guys this earlier, um, the pathway data. Knowledge dissemination, I mentioned, don't just like wait and hope that it'll get out to the world, really make sure you're pushing it out. And I think this is my second to last slide. Uh, a couple cartoons here. Um, the cartoon on the left is um, of someone showing someone a wheel and saying, I have this brand new idea. And so clearly this person's reinventing the wheel. And uh, one, of the, one of the main reasons why I wrote Chasing My Cure, uh, the book that we, that we mentioned earlier, was because I feel like we reinvented a lot of wheels for Castleman disease. We were fighting a lot of the fights that many of you all have fought. I feel like oftentimes we're often fighting similar fights. Um, but sometimes it's hard for us to ever have the time to like document what we did. You know, what was our war strategy? How did we get from A to Z? Because we're still fighting. You know, none of us have, have, have achieved you know, what we're going for. We haven't won the war yet. And so this was my attempt to like actually get kind of my battle plan down onto paper. Um, and, and as Christian mentioned before, there's a, a copy available um, for everyone um, at, the, at the back of the room. So everyone, I hope you guys will, will take your free copy. Um, and hopefully it'll be helpful to learn about our battle plan. Um, the other uh, cartoon is uh, of an old dog reading a book about new tricks. And I think that that's another important lesson here where this drug I'm on, Serolimus, was developed 25 years ago for kidney transplantation. Um, it's an old dog. You know, we thought that it worked on one thing. It works in lamb and many other diseases. Um, but we never thought that about it working in Castleman disease. How many other drugs, how many other old dogs are there out there um, where there maybe are new tricks? Uh, and so just closing, this is my, my last slide. Um, lessons learned from chasing my cure. Like I said, I... Um, 
I learned a lot from my experiences. I learned a lot about life and about living from nearly dying five times. Um, but I also learned a lot about how do you chase after a cure. And we probably should retitle it Chasing Our Cures because um, hopefully the progress that we're making will help many other Castleman's patients. And, and what I really hope is that it'll help uh, many other rare diseases. Um, the first is that we really need to work together within and across rare diseases. I mentioned Chasing Our Cures. Uh, many times there isn't collaboration within a disease, so sometimes it's hard to say, well, if we can't even get people to collaborate in our rare disease, how are we going to collaborate across rare diseases? But I think we, as a community, uh, can, can actually change that. Uh, I mentioned earlier we have to establish what's known today in order to determine what to do tomorrow. Uh, this collaborative network approach that we've um, followed has been really helpful for us. It certainly hasn't been perfect. There have been many challenges along the way. I think there are still better ways we could get more samples from more researchers and more collaboration. Um, but it's a good way, I think, that's helped us a lot. And it, it would you know, mean a lot, and it would be very special if it could help uh, many other rare diseases. Um, there are many new tools that, that can be leveraged. Um, genomic tools, transcriptomics, proteomics, I mentioned some of those were used in my case, to actually identify what's gone wrong in the biology um, to then be able to repurpose drugs. Uh, another is that if you do repurpose drugs, we need to systematically track how well those drugs are doing. We shouldn't just be trying drugs and never learning whether it works or whether it doesn't work, because then patients are just going to either keep getting a drug that doesn't help them, or maybe some patients won't get a drug that could help them. Uh, another is that I really feel like I'm in overtime. I mentioned that earlier, I'm in my fifth overtime. Um, but I've also learned, and, and you guys all know this, uh, the truth is we're all in overtime. And you know, none of us know what tomorrow holds. And uh, we really do need to make the most of every second. Another is to question the status quo. If uh, I hadn't questioned the way that we research and treat, treat Castleman disease, I, I, I certainly wouldn't be standing here, I wouldn't be alive today if we hadn't taken a different approach and, and found a different treatment. Um, another is for the gentleman in the room. I hope that you're never confused as a pregnant woman, but if you are, I hope you find some humor in that and life's challenges. For the women in the room, I hope you're never confused as your father's pregnant wife, um, but if you are, I do hope you'll also find uh, some humor in that. I think that it's just so important in the midst of tough times. Um, another is that solutions may be hiding in plain sight. So this drug, serolimus, that's saving my life. I'm literally here because of it. It was at my neighborhood pharmacy. I walked past it when I was in and out of the hospital for three and a half years, nearly dying five times. I walked past it every day. And no one had ever thought to try it. I had never thought to try it. You know, how many other drugs are, are hiding in plain sight? How many other solutions? And, and the last point is that it really does take an army. Um, if it was me working on my own, we would have made about 1% or probably less than that of the progress that we've made. Um, but because I've had this incredible army of people working with me, we've made even more progress. But what I really encourage us as a community to think about is how can our armies join together? You know, we're, we all have armies working on our, on our given rare diseases, but how can we be one collective, rare as one, one community all working together? And um, again, thank you guys so much for being here. And hopefully today ends up being a really positive day for all of you. Thank you. We're all in overtime, so we're just going to yes. take two questions. <laughs> overtime, that's right. <laughs> hey, uh, John Boutel, uh, Systemic JAF Foundation. Uh, I wanted to know if you could speak a little bit to the um, dealing with the uh, various motivations of researchers, uh, because the idea of, of uh, building a research community the way you described seems predicated on the idea that there's lots of dedicated researchers that are committed to finding a cure for a disease, which is, is true, and, and you know these people are heroic. But at the same time, uh, researchers are trapped in a you know publish or perish system yes. where they're they're basically playing a zero sum game yep. with all the other people that are like them. There's the problem of, of of scooping of people going for the juiciest targets. They're also humans, right? So they're operating inside a, a political system where cliques form and people don't like each other. So can you talk about you know? when you get past the idealized model of just everybody wants to help, and yep. there, but there's also all, this, all of these other motivations and managing that inside a community of practice and research. It's really, really hard. I, I totally agree that um, getting physicians and researchers aligned and um, getting priorities aligned is really, really hard. I think that what we can do as advocates is provide 
the samples and the data that are gonna make it as easy as possible for that researcher to get that project across the finish line um, and support and, and also inspiration. My lab loves it when Castleman disease patients come by because it helps, it inspires them further, it reminds them why they're doing it. So know that you can inspire, you can give samples, you can give data, and you can give money. And so if you can do those four things, then you're doing everything you can to make sure that that given researcher is kind of on, on on par, at least going in the right direction um, to, uh, um, to get close to, to their pro professional goals. Ron Garber from the IF Foundation for 4-H Leukodystrophy. It, thank you for taking my question. My, it's a related question, maybe a little narrower. We, we, our disease area sort of has our three stars, to yeah. use your terminology, and in fact there are three, and they're wonderful. Uh, how, do you, how, do, how do the stars react when you yeah. Look for new stars to, to do studies, and how do we make sure that they're on board with that? Yeah, it very. Uh, it's it's you know very um, different between um, individuals, but in our experience, um, not well. Uh, you know, our stars in the Castleman space did not react well early on to my approach. Um, but we hadn't made much progress for 60 years, and so um, it felt like we needed to have take a different approach. But yeah, they did not take it well, and um, as we brought in other people. And we just started kind of moving without the stars. The stars kind of came back. And so um, it's not, I, I guess, like, it's hard. It's really, really hard. But um, your, uh, you know, it, it's in, in many ways, in a lot of rare diseases, there are oligarchies within a particular rare disease. And there's a few that have kind of all the power. And it's really hard to break through that because you don't want to alienate them because they have all the power. They know the disease. Oftentimes, they're treating our loved ones. But uh, you have to figure out a way to bring in others and, and maybe um, include them in that process of bringing in others uh, and helping them to see that, you know, maybe they don't have the exact skill set to do that work, but they can really focus in another area. Uh, maybe we can squeeze in one more. I'm persistent. Hey, David. Um, data is so critical to the entire community. Manually trying to get the medical records by patients must be both time consuming, painful, and time is not on our side. Yep. There was a law passed last year, and some of you may on your iPhone be able to download the medical record using HealthKit through it through their API. Apple, yeah. There are a number of APIs out there that allow patients to literally all they need is their login for their patient portal to download their medical record. Have you thought about that? And have, has this community thought about this type of functionality? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I need to look more into what, what is available today. I know that when we set out on this journey back in like 2014 or 2015 to, to create this sort of database, everyone kept saying like it's right around the corner. You know, Blue Button technology is going to be here in the next couple months where medical records are going to seamlessly move from the medical record into your registry. Um, and I kind of waited a little bit, and then I just decided to stop waiting and like, you know, let's just let's do the manual approach. Um, but I think that you're right. I think that now is the time where there are actually some things like HealthKit, like you mentioned, we need to look into further. Typically, when you get those downloads, at least through like an Epic portal, you get access to the structured data, like lab tests, but you don't get access to the clinical data, like the unstructured stuff. Um, but man, it would be nice to get the structured stuff. So no, we definitely need to look into that further. And, and as a community, a rare disease community, I think that we definitely need to, to not always take the long road that we're taking of you know, going through manually every record. But, but I think others can appreciate um, the lack of patience that I had to say, like, I'm not going to wait any longer for this like, kind of dream scenario. We're just going to go after it. Um, but I think sometimes we probably should wait. Good, good question. I agree. Thank you so much, David. Another round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Thanks so much, David. David's going to stay with us for the next session. Uh, did you uh, Did you want to get a? Uh I'll just, make, I'll just make a, a, a I don't know if we, do we have time for a, a quick picture of it. So we do this thing called the Castleman Warrior Flex, and it's like where we it's like we're Castleman Warriors. Um, I know we're a little bit behind on time, but but maybe we've got time for. A do flex. we have time for a Castleman Flex? Okay, so basically it's like, but this is the thing. It's it's not just a flex. It's like in your face too. Your face. 
And, and then, so we're gonna post about this. I hope you guys will also like Warrior Flex post, because it's like a rare disease, Warrior Flex. And hopefully you'll help to spread the word about chasing my cure along the way. So, okay, so this is, so you know, maybe, for, yeah, we'll all we'll come, come out here. If you guys don't mind standing up, and then we're, we're Warrior Flexing. I don't know, you might have to take multiple pictures. Again, it's in your face too, it's like, ooh. Nice, thanks guys, thank you.